What am I going to talk about on a uh, Friday evening with a mega dose of coffee? What was it that um, Johnny Depp said in the trial? A mega pint. Uh, I'm, I feel like I look I have a, like I have a tan, and I really haven't been outside. Hopefully the microphone is <clears throat> working. I don't feel like I have much of a voice for whatever reason. And um, this is a chill, a chill night uh, video. I am not going all hyper uh, edited and cleaned up and all that kind of stuff. I started off, hopefully I don't get um, copyright restrictions on that last thing I did. I'm going to be... Anybody know this song? I love playing it so that I can play this one chord. Um, I, f I fake that. I'll show you the chord right here. So you got the B section or pre chorus. Here we go. Here it is. That's it. I love playing that. <laughs> anyway, um, got a couple of things to talk about. Yeah, so like I said, this is not going to be hyper edited. I mean, the last video I did was about Beyonce. And, um, you know, some people would probably label that as one of those get off my lawn, angry at the clouds uh, kind of video. And I mean, that's, you could take it for what it's worth. I came across another guy's video, Tom Buka, Bukovac, the session guitar player from Nashville. And he did a, uh, a bit of a thing on Nashville songwriting lately, um, which was, you know, another get off my lawn type of thing, but he's talking about the reality that every song in Nashville right now is four chords. It's a four, four chord pattern, basically four bar pattern. Um, and that never changes. So there's no, there's no other chords in the song. You just basically play the same pattern over and over again. So more than likely someone made a loop of a chord progression. And so then they write to that, according to what he said, with 10, or, 10 writers in the room, and that's not an exaggeration, 10 writers in the room, and a laptop opened to chat GPT for lyric ideas. Um, I mean, I talked about it with another butt of mine yesterday morning. I, Back in the day, people used to use a, a rhyming dictionary, and that was kind of, you know, you could say some people would think it's a faux pas, you know, but, but it, it's, you know, or taboo. But the idea that you would now maybe maybe come up with a title, I'm, I think they're using ChatGPT for the titles too. So you, you can, in other words, you could say like, hey, ChatGPT, write me a tune give me some lyrics or a title of a song about a, a Nashville girl that meets a, a Texas guy and chat GPT will spit out a bunch of titles gladly, you know, without any sweat. And, um, and then they're off to the races. Then they can start giving it other prompts and saying like, Hey, uh, you know, talk about how we met when we were in high school on a class trip or, you know, I'm just giving you for instances. That's how formulaic writing, songwriting has become in a lot of genres. And uh, now I will segue, I'll, I'll segue a little bit into this thing. There's this guy on uh, YouTube, Andy Edwards. Uh, he's a Brit, I believe. Um, he's got the accent at least. Uh, no, I'm 99% sure he's British. And he does a lot of videos talking about the demise of, let's just say, the death of rock or, you know, what killed 
rock music. And his latest one, I think, was something like Dance Music Killed Rock Music. And I've had this chat with myself and with a bunch of people about music. Uh, it's always like a thing that comes up, whether it's in the studio, on a little, taking a little breather, or on the phone, or um, at a cigar shop, or whatever. The, the, topic comes up of like you know what's what's killing this type of music why did this type of music die or whatever and i'll give you my my one of my quick theories um i'll give it to you as quickly as i can uh i do believe that music popular music is a pro somewhat of a product now all these things are like you know there's there's gray areas so don't kill me on super technicalities. I think these are just, this particular topic is a contributing factor to how music genres have become popular and other ones have died off. And I'll start with like, in the you know, 50s and 60s, the, the record or the, the, the cheap record became a thing and and then you know am radio rock and roll radio and that music benefited from the fact that people were spending a lot of time in their cars they put radios in cars and people listened to rock and roll music in their car um and then like on a portable Portable radios were invented at that point. Uh, my dad had, an, uh, had one from the 60s that I have still have somewhere. And um, that, you know, rock and roll music was kind of being invented along those lines in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And uh, they benefited from the technology that was, that, kind of work together with the rock and roll music, particularly the car with the, the little speaker in the back or the speaker in the dash. You know, anyone that's, um, I mean, below the age of uh, 40 probably doesn't even know that car, car stereos used to be like one speaker in the front, maybe one speaker in the back. That was, that was like a big deal. And, and AM radio was how you listen to music, and it was mono. And the music was catered to the technology and the technology catered to the music in a lot of ways. You know, they were trying to keep up with each other. Like, Hey, wow, there's an AM radio in the car. Let's like, let's make sure our mixes of our music sound good in the car. Um, and then we got into the, what I like to say is we like, we got into the seventies and the, the high fi was came along that was like the home stereo with two speakers eventually they had four with the whole quadraphonic thing but i don't know that that really took off but you had hi-fi stereos and it became a big deal to have one of these in your house and that's when all the records started sounding let's just say more intimate like, uh, you know, all your singer-songwriters, the Carol Kings, the Jim Croce's and the, the 70s Beatles, you know, the records that, that sort of crossed over into the 70s with Elton John, um, Billy Joel, Rod Stewart. All these records sounded, I, I remember as a little kid being in my cousin's, like, uh, recreation room, I guess they called it, and he had... A fancy stereo and he put on um al stewart year of the cat and i remember like to this day i must have been maybe i was 10 but to me that sounded like nothing i've ever heard before and then you know the, the, the studios catered to making those types of sounding records and music in stereo dark Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd, all these amazing high fidelity, that was another term, high fidelity, hi-fi, uh, was kind of like a thing in the 70s. Um, 
as we got into the 80s, the the guitars started taking over more and more and getting heavier and heavier. And they had the arena rock thing that sort of took over the world early 80s, along with Madonna's and New Wave. There was, there was if anything you wanted to hear at that time was, was you had access to it. You could, you could, there was a crossover from the 70s of, Disco, new wave, album rock, arena rock, and then you got into pop and new wave into the eighties, um, and then heavy metal, hard rock, hair metal. Um, so everything was all fine and good going through the eighties for rock in particular, and um, and that's when music was still a communal thing. And car stereos started getting better and better. They started getting you know four speakers in your car and maybe six speakers in your car and then some people would get i think in the 80s they were starting to get into subwoofers a little bit but it was there used to be a thing where you would you would buy a car and then you would take it to a car stereo installation joint and get a car stereo installed and that's when music was much more of a group thing like like you would you would pick someone up in your car and we'd be like what are we listening to today in the car um what do you got what cd do you have uh, the, when we got you had, you had cassettes in the car for a while there and then it, then at some point you sort of if you got a cd player in your car it was kind of a big deal so but all this music was sounding great on car stereos and then I remember a shift going into the 90s, the subwoofer and the big system in the car became a thing. And I, there was even cars that you could buy that already had the sub in it. And truthfully, rock music was slow to embrace the low end that was there for the taking on a on a system that had a subwoofer and who came in barnstorming was hip-hop hip-hop was embracing the the 808 and uh, that's a low sub kick drum for those of you that aren't really musical technical people but um so if you had a, a killer car stereo and you wanted to show it off, you wanted something that had some sub bass to it um, so that you could literally vibrate the hell out of the neighborhood and also whoever dared to get in your car. There were a few rock acts early that got into the sub thing and that would be a, like the industrial music kind of thing, like Nine Inch Nails, they're... Their early 90s albums sounded amazing in a car stereo with the sub because they were embracing the electronic drum kit um, or at least sounds that were incorporating some of that even if they were using real drums. I'm not real like a, a Nine Inch Nails aficionado, but I do know that like when I was in my friend's car that I had a good stereo and he for the first time put uh, the album Fragile in you know it, it was shocking and it was also blowing the doors off of the 80s rock stuff that was really catered towards bright mid-range and mid-range oriented uh music and that all those things were mixed in the studio all those rock records were mixed on typically on ns10 Yamaha monitors which had no low end because no one was pushing the low end because it was all about mid-range it was all about guitars and vocals and snare drums clicky kick drums pointy kick drums that tore your head off to some degree um and that is to me that opened the door to the whole hip-hop and dance music 
thing because that stuff just sounded amazing on an amazing subby system. And if you went to a club, uh, they had all those frequencies that they were pushing. And what would sound better, that or something with a, you know, some abrasive guitars tearing your head off? So just a little slight theory uh, from me. I mean, some of my friends think I'm nuts with that one, but I do think that then you had the, the introduction of the iPod, early 2000s or early aughts, whatever you want to call it, um, which catered to the, you know, which had the, the really bad eye buds or earbuds in the beginning with the, with this cable, which I guess is back in style now. Um, but those had no bass. And so if you put on a, a record from, or, you know, a recording from the eighties with those that you were playing from your iPod, it sounded like ass because there was no bottom whatsoever. There was no hype whatsoever. So it sounded even worse. So your, your hip hop, your nineties hip hop and things like that sounded great in the iPod earbuds, or at least decent compared to the rock stuff, which was as Andy Edwards would like to say, and you could look him up when you want and check out some of his stuff. But like, I'd like to add, to his add some fuel to his fire as to why dance music or or he didn't really get into hip hop killing rock but i mean let's face it the even the rock kids shifted into hip hop and then some someone into grunge but grunge didn't have that low end either so i mean i'm trying i'm making it sound like people are and maybe uh, low end or low frequency addicts, but I think they are. I think it just sounds better. It's cool. I mean, you never really hear you never hear someone complain about um, you know maybe a little too much bass on that. You hear, wow, why is it so tinny? Um, often about rock music, or why is that why is that snare drum so annoying, or that kick drum sound like it's a tin can being hit by a rock. So, um, I've been trying out some new pedals today. I won't inflict that upon you. Um, but, uh, this is my, um, delay pedal by that company, Flamma, which, uh, some people say it's an Amazon company, but I don't think it is. I don't know how it's going to sound with the with the lavalier and all that, but this is just a chill Friday. Let me get some more of my. <clears throat> let me sip some coffee. Some people would say it's late. Uh, you know, drinking coffee late doesn't that doesn't that keep you up? Yes, that's exactly what it's for. Uh, you drink coffee if you want to stay awake longer or stay wired up. Um, it doesn't really have the effect on me as it does on, as it, you know, maybe it did when I was 15 or 16 years old. That's when I drank a lot of Mountain Dew. So it's becoming spring in New York City, big deal. Um, yesterday there was, the parking restrictions were suspended or parking regulations were suspended so you don't have to move your car because typically you have to move your car so that they can clean one side of the street so whatever day it is you got to move your car if it's in the wrong spot you got to move it out of the way so they can clean that side of the street that day so yesterday they were suspended for a holiday and this will tell you how effed up New York City is at this point now unorganized. They make a big deal out of giving people tickets if they don't move their car out of the way for the street cleaner. And I think the ticket's probably 65 bucks now. And, you know, the guy come or a guy or a woman comes walking through and they want to give you the ticket if you're in the wrong spot. But anyway, yesterday they were suspended and it was raining. 
And while I was parking my car, because I went to the store and I came back, I look and who's coming down the street? The street cleaner. In the rain, down the middle of the road, because the regulations were, were suspended. Um, and it's just typical. Of like, you know, what is this guy doing riding down the street, cleaning the street, in the rain, in the middle of the road? Um the middle of the road doesn't need to be cleaned. It's, you know, it's the edges. And uh, it's a bizarre time in New York City. Everything is upside down. Anybody that tells you it isn't is totally nuts or delusional or lying for whatever reason, um, whatever their motivations are. But it's crazy. And um, it, it is what we... It is what it is now. It's not going away. I was going to read this quote. Um, it's from a movie. Maybe I won't, I won't tell you what movie it's from. And if anybody can guess without Googling it, uh, tell me... What is the quote? We are the middle children of history. We have no great war, no depression. Our war is a spiritual war. Um, it couldn't be more like accurate right now. There's a couple other things that are involved with the quote. I won't get into the, all the technicalities of it, but um, I feel it here. I feel the. I feel it in the country spiritual war. Um, so this is probably not what you were expecting from a Tony Black NYC video on a Friday evening, but it is what it is.